Good afternoon everybody and welcome to the latest in our Urban Living webinar series. Um, if you could please, as you can see on the holding slide there, keep your microphone and camera off unless you're one of our speakers. Uh, it makes life a lot less confusing for everybody. Thank you. So today's topic couldn't really be more current. Um, the office of tomorrow versus the office of yesterday. Um, there's an awful lot of confusion around how we are going to interact with the workplace now, where we're going to work from, what the balance is from home working versus being uh, in a main office. So um, we're going to have a good chat about that today. This session is the latest in our Urban Living webinar series, which is a precursor to a live event which we're launching later this year, um, November 25th and 26th at Tobacco Dock in London. Uh, the event will focus on how hospitality and real estate asset classes are blurring. Um, it's gonna be a fantastic event. We can't wait to have, um, meet loads of people face to face for a change, it's been a long time. Um, and hopefully loads of you who are on this session can join us there. And the great news is, for a limited time only, we are discounting tickets. Um, we feel that like everybody is desperate to get out and do some proper networking rather than, I shouldn't slag off Zoom calls because we're doing one at the moment, but you know, they, they have their limits. We, we want to get out and uh, do some face-to-face -face networking and doing business and we're sure that you do too. So you can get 40% off uh, tickets for the Urban Living Festival if you go to urbanlivingfestival.com and use the discount code ULF40. Um, just a couple of bits of housekeeping for this session. Uh, as I said, if you can keep yourself muted and your camera off, unless you're one of our speakers. Um, we will have around a 40 to 45 minute discussion with our panelists, uh, and then we'll get round to some Q&A. You can submit your questions, via the chat function in Zoom, please do. We'll, we'll answer as many of them as we can at the end of the session. Uh, there will be a recording of the session sent to everybody who's registered via email over the next couple of days. My name's George Sell. I'm Editor-in-Chief at International Hospitality Media, and we are a B2B publisher and an events organizer for the hospitality sector. Got a great panel of urban innovators with us today. Unfortunately, Bruce, who was uh, supposed to be joining us, could not make it, but uh, we've got a great panel here nonetheless. I'm gonna ask them all to introduce themselves shortly, but before that, just want to um, give you some context for the discussion today. So there's been a lot of stuff in the press recently about uh, the world of work and how it's gonna change. And, uh, just taken a few things which caught my eye over the past few weeks. So there's quite a bit of talk about hub and spoke. So big organizations having a smaller uh, main office and more regional um, premises around the country. Um, it reduces the need for commuting and, and opens up uh, a potentially larger geographical area to, to attract your workforce. Um, and just to show you some of the, sorry, can you just, just, just go back to the one, thanks. The, uh, just to show you some of the um, contradicting attitudes to going back to work, um, the UK Civil Service is urging its staff to go back, but their union has warned its members will go on strike if they're forced to return. So it's a pretty polarised um, debate at the moment. Um, a couple of months ago, Verdict polled readers from across its websites about their preferred future way of working and around half voted for a mix of working remotely and returning to the office. Um, and 27% uh, wanted to return to the office full time and another 27 wanted to work from home full time. So pretty divided, as you can see. Uh, a report from Morgan Lovell about what the future of the office might look like had some quite interesting conclusions. Um, Elements of design drawn from boutique hospitality and co-working venues will inspire a team's sense of pride and shared purpose. Um, there'll be a demise in traditional workstations as the focused to-do list will be undertaken at home. 
this will result in an acceleration towards multi-purpose activity-based working. Uh, a fresh and more intense connection with nature through the use of biophilic design will be a reassuring and intrinsic element to our new relationship with our office space. We'll talk about that um, more later, particularly with, with Shelley, I'm sure. Um, this quote made me laugh from a, a freelance graphic designer from London called Abigail. I miss human energy, that connection and direct communication. You just can't replicate that at home. I've really missed it and can't wait to go back at some point. I haven't missed other people's lunch smells though. Um, the other thing that is potentially likely to happen is a repurposing of office space into other uses. Um, although uh, Knight Frank say this won't be quite as dramatic as some people think because the increased amount of space that will be needed per employee. So there's a bit of context and background to the discussion. Um, what I'd like to do now is just to take a poll of everybody on the call. Uh, and ask you when you think you will be going back to your office. So, um, Prab, if we could run the poll, please. Bear with us a second, folks, <laughs> while we try and get the technology working. Okay, that doesn't seem to be happening at the moment. We can maybe come back to that in a minute. Um, perhaps right. while, we're waiting, while we're waiting for that, we could ask our three panelists to introduce themselves, please. So I'll go uh, left to right as I can see you on my screen. So Tom, would you like to kick off? Yeah, sure. Um, hi everyone, I'm Tom. I'm one of the co-founders of Andco. Um, Anco is a, basically a booking platform that allows remote workers uh, and remote teams to book hot desks uh, and meeting rooms in hospitality venues in their downtime. So we work a lot with hotels, um, pubs, bars, restaurants um, that have excess space. Um, and we've seen a huge demand for, uh, for, our, for hot desks and meeting rooms, not only now through um, individual remote workers, but also uh, through corporates that are now reducing office space. Um, I'm sure we'll go, into more of that. Um, but yeah, it's been an interesting lockdown for us. We uh, normally have about 120 venues live across London. Um, obviously overnight um, that went down to zero. Uh, we're now in a sort of phased reopening of, uh, of the venues, um, making sure that we can open safely, um, but have seen huge demand for people wanting to break out of their own homes again and, and back into the wild. Um, so yeah. That's that's me and Andco. Do you have a, a, a rough idea in your head when you think the majority of your properties will be open again? Uh, it's a difficult one. We get asked that a lot um, by members and uh, obviously investors as well. Um, we're roughly, I think we have about 25 venues that are now back up and running. Um, it obviously depends a lot on what happens over the next couple of weeks um, and what Boris decides to do. Um, obviously, there's quite a lot of uncertainty around, um, you know, how it's how it's going, how COVID is impacting hospitality, uh, especially. Um, we're hoping that we'll have a clear idea towards the end of this month. Um, a lot of the venues are kind of playing it by ear, month on month. Yeah. And um, so we have, you know, catch ups with them on a on a sort of weekly basis, trying to work with them to to reopen as safely as possible. Great. Thanks, Tom. Shelley, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, of course. My name is Shelley Reiner and I'm the director of Suited Interior Design. Um, <clears throat> we are here today in the discussion because we, um, we, we work remotely. We always have worked remotely. We call ourselves the free range chickens. So we, ha we have some experience in, in this pre-pandemic, pre um, but also because we've sort of been um, doing some work in re-looking at how um, hotels are designed so that they can um, provide a lot more flexible spaces and usage um, to increase revenue generation. And part of that is um, bringing in the element of the workplace into the hotel environment. Okay, thanks. 
And Charlie, over to you. Hi everyone, I'm Charlie. I am one of the co-founders and directors of Cuckoo's Nest, which is a flexible co-working space with a nursery oh. um, for children three and their parents. So predominantly focused on freelancers, self-employed and SMEs based in central London. Great, thanks Charlie. Um, if you'd like to connect with any of our speakers, you can see their LinkedIn uh, profiles in the chat there. I'm sure they'd love to hear from you. So let's start by maybe talking about uh, a kind of broad brush picture and, that, and there aren't any right answers to this question, but what is your gut feeling um, about how, the f how people will work in the future in terms of how much time they'll spend working from home, how much time they'll spend going into an office, and perhaps how much time they'll spend using um, something like uh, an Anco or, or a cuckoo's nest. Um, do you want to kick off, Charlie? Sure. So we um, have already reopened again. So obviously, as a nursery, we were closed from the 23rd of March for a couple of months, um, but reopened on the 1st of June. So, um, Tom, I'm ready for you to list us. Um, but we have children in our nursery and parents back on site working, although it's socially distanced and probably half the number of, of people that we have capacity for. Um, so I think I see it really mixed. I see obviously freelancers, people that work for themselves coming back and using the office space, although where we are situated in, in Farringdon, <clears throat> it's completely dead. So we're next door to LinkedIn's head office and opposite Moonpig um, and they're all you know completely empty and all you get is the old fire alarm test um, so I think it's a real mixture but having surveyed our members kind of constantly throughout um, lockdown and I appreciate it's a niche kind of market but a lot of them are saying they want to go back into an office type space they, they need separation from work and home and perhaps that's because they all have children so that adds something um, of, a, of a stress but um, yeah I, I don't know what the answer is unfortunately but staying positive. Yeah have you seen uh, I mean you you said your your client base initially was predominantly freelancers do you think you're going to see an increase in demand from people working for big companies who, who don't want to go into a central office and would rather use a facility like yours? Yeah, hopefully, hopefully. I mean, what I've seen a lot of in the last, I'd say, two or three weeks is bigger teams of, say, 15, 20, moving out of a big co-working space, uh, you know, not a bad name, we work with someone like that, where there's big, you know, touch points, human interaction, elevators, um, and wanting something that's more self-contained, where they have more control over the number of people that are in the office. Um, and again, I think to Tom's point, we've had a, a request in today actually from one of the, the big um, big four um, about using us for an offsite day because they, they don't want to go into their office, but they would they would use our, our space for a kind of a workshop for the day. So I think it's interesting and I think we've all got to stay as, as flexible as possible with who our client is and who our customer is. Yeah, thanks, Charlie. Shelley, what's your what's your take on on what will be the main changes in the way people work and, and the balance of how they work from from people you've been speaking to? Yeah, I think we, we've been listening a lot to what's been going on and most of the polls that I've heard of saying, most people are saying that uh, it's not an either or situation. There aren't that many people who want to go back full time and there aren't a ton of people who want to not go back at all, but it's rather a, a happy medium. So it seems most people kind of want to go back two to three days a week. Um, and, and, but they actually like being at home, um, the other two days because it's given people a lot of time to connect with their family. Um, you know, and I think that that's, um, having that balance and it also gives you the opportunity to be able to get things done during the work, work day and you don't have to cram it into the weekend. I think having that life balance is something that people have been talking about for a very long time, but have never actually been able to get. And this has mm -hmm. all of a sudden shown them how that can happen and I think they want to stay in that um, stay in that space and Tom what's your what's your general hunch around this um, yeah I think just to echo both of those arguments it's it's not a binary argument I don't think it's either or it's not working from home or working from the office it's about finding the balance 
uh, and, and being able to work from anywhere. I mean, we've kind of seen it for, for years now that, you know, there's co-working spaces on the beach in Bali or in the Caribbean or, or where it, wherever it is. You know, as long as you've got a, a Wi-Fi connection and a laptop, you can pretty much work from anywhere. And it's only taken a kind of global pandemic to, to make everyone realize that remote work is, is now mainstream and is possible. Um, and I think, you know, quite frankly, the companies that don't offer any kind of remote working strategy will probably fall behind. Um, yeah, I, I, it's really difficult to tell, you know, which way it's going to swing, but, um, you know, it's, it's remote works kind of catapulted forward 10 years in the last six months. Um, and it, you know, it only takes 30 days to, to kind of create behavior. So, you know, we're, we're a long way through, through from that. Um, and, you know, definitely for us, it's, you know, COVID is obviously a terrible thing, but we've seen a huge amount of, um, of interest in what we're doing. And especially from the, the kind of the, the corporates that are scaling back on office space because they don't want to commute into central, central town anymore you know it's all about supporting local communities local neighborhoods if you could spend your commuting money on you know spending that in a local shop you know why why wouldn't you do that um so it's yeah it's been an interesting lockdown i think it's it's going to get more and more interesting going forward yeah the the concept of the the, the co-working space on the beach for for remote working uh, you know there there are there are a few people who have kind of marketed to that audience. I think they call them global nomads, but I, w I would have thought until fairly recently, they were quite a rare beast, you know, uh, um, pretty much you had to be a freelancer and a very well paid freelancer, I think to live that lifestyle. But do you, do you think that um, kind of blue chip companies now might be more willing to have their people much more mobile traveling more and working from different locations if they can find the right facilities to do it definitely i mean we've already seen demand from corporates asking for exactly that um it's being able to have the flexibility to work from anywhere um but being able to do it reliably reliably is is obviously very important um so yeah i mean I, you've already you know in, in at the beginning of lockdown google announced that you know, employees were able to expense up to I think five thousand dollars worth of remote working equipment and that just shows you know it's one of the biggest companies in the world doing it so people will just follow suit um and as I said just now you know people the, the companies that aren't putting in remote working strategies in place will really struggle you know that things like remote working tech you know being able to spend more time with your families having a much better work-life balance not having to commute you know, on average 47 minutes each way, or whatever it is, every single day. It's you know, the huge uh, benefits to working remotely and being able to choose your own office and choose your own environment that you actually want to spend time in and surround yourself with the people that you want to spend time with. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, it probably will be seen as a, as a benefit going forward to, to employees, which is, I think, probably one of the best benefits that you can have um, working for a, for a company that really promotes choice, flexibility, and ultimately freedom. Yeah, yeah. Um, in terms of the actual physical office, um, Shelley, what do you think is going to change in office design as a result of the pandemic? We, we already saw before COVID, um, uh, another one of these kind of buzzwords the hotelization of the office so hospitality design techniques were being used um, to design office space so what do you think we're going to see going forward in, in new office developments to react to what's happening at the moment yeah i i mean i don't know because we're hospitality designers so i haven't thought about it from you know putting a hat of a, of a workplace designer on but um I think for sure the thing is is that people are social and we're not going to get away from that and like we were just saying nobody really wants to do remote working full time i don't think and so the social environment is is still uh, radically important there's a need for that and i think what will happen is that <clears throat> workplace in general will become uh, more like a social hub and the models for that are probably people like Soho House and uh, Mortimer House and um, 
I can't remember. There's another couple of them in the U.S. But um, you know, there there are places that you can um, what that you can go, and they have lounge areas. Um, so there's opportunity to sit and have a coffee and an intimate conversation. But they also have meeting rooms, so you can have a proper boardroom meeting should you need one of a serious nature. Um, but those meeting rooms are flexible and they could be turned into event spaces. So in the evening, that meeting room could easily be transformed into a private dining area. Um, you know, you may have small little private booths within these very large areas in case people want to take off and just have a small quiet call. I imagine that they will start to integrate, um, as Charlie has done, childcare that needs to be that needs to be implemented into these spaces because that's a huge problem for many people. So um, I see the design of of workplace and and potentially even hotels moving towards the model of a private members club uh, more than anything else where you have a membership and um, it offers you a lot of different types of working and um, socializing uh, opportunities. Thanks Shelley. Charlie, you, you've had a background in hospitality as, as well as the workspace. So what did you take from that when you were designing the, the Cuckoo's Nest property? I mean, um, that's a good question. I mean, I think the, you know, what you guys are doing with ULF is obviously showing that the boundaries between, you know, within hospitality and, and the workspace and everything is really, really blurred. I think, you know, this space as a service tagline is overused. But I mean, I've always felt that design is important um, because everyone's up their game. So, you know, I don't think it's good enough to just have an office with the basic functionalities. It's very difficult now because, you know, I don't know that people want to return to an office which is like a, you know, 1970s library with cubicles that, um, you know, just personally, I, I hate going into Sainsbury's when they have all the plastic divisions up. So I think it's such a difficult thing at the moment to design a space that functions as an office that allows that social element, that human interaction, which is so important, but that keeps everyone safe in an environment where the rules change every five minutes. When you come to open future Cuckoo's Nest premises, is there anything you've learned from the current period that you would apply to that physical environment that, that you maybe haven't got in the first one? How, how would you change it for future premises? Um, another good question. I mean, I think that um, when we designed Cuckoo's Nest, we were going into it you know, head first without um, knowing anything about running a nursery for starters or a workspace. As you say, my background was surface departments and before that's always been a residential property. So, um, you know, it was it was a good stab, at a good attempt at creating a co-working space. I think what I've learned is co-working. Um, the I think you need to be able to offer service, uh, uh, service offices or the ability to change a space much more flexibly than we have. Um, you know, with, for example, our upstairs workspace is a bespoke 16 man desk, like you might see at the Ace Hotel. We can't do anything with that. We can't divide it up, move it around. So I think having flexibility within design is something that, you know, and, and speaking to a lot of the people in kind of co-living and, and PRS, I think, you know, spending the time up front thinking about design and the user experience is even more important than it, than it was before. Mm -hmm. Uh, Tom, with, with um, your members able to use such a large number of hospitality properties, you obviously see a, a lot of different designs and a lot of different uh, physical environments. Do you think hotel designers by and large are thinking about your kind of customer when they're, when they're designing communal spaces? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, Shelley probably be able to answer that better than me, but um, Definitely, I, you know, the, they're definitely looking at the future of remote working and how that impacts space. And I think, you know, during lockdown, it became pretty evident the hotels that hadn't diversified enough. It's not just about sort of room keys anymore. They have to think about how they maximize, you know, their square footage, basically, rather than just thinking about, you know, how many, how many rooms they've, they've sold that, that night. 
um, you know, when we first set up Andco, we were sort of going after a lot of the smaller independents. We were working with coffee shops, pubs, bars, restaurants. But actually, we've seen from the booking behavior that people just prefer using hotel lobbies because they're better set up for working in anyway. They're kind of used to transient business people coming in and out and on a daily basis, sitting there, um, you know, doing some work on a laptop. So they've got, they're, they're better suited with plugs, you know, more plugs, better Wi-Fi. Um, you know, they've got reception areas. The, the whole u user experience of a hotel is, is, is essentially like a co-working space anyway. Um, but we've definitely seen in some of the some of the newer venues or some of the newer hotels that we've onboarded recently that there is real thought that goes into the kind of the ergonomics of the space, and that they are more set up like desks than they are, um, you know, restaurant tables or whatever it is. I mean, we always laugh when we go into a restaurant and they've got cutlery and glasses on the table because you immediately think that you've got to spend fifty, sixty pounds on a lunch but actually what they should be doing is having a completely clear space where you can imagine yourself working there for a couple of hours that's you know there's there's thousands of these people doing this around the city every single day um but there there's a lot of you know small simple tricks that you can incorporate into your space that will invite those types of people in you know from whether it's spatial design to what you're selling on the menu you know pubs you might not want to spend 15 pounds on a burger and a pint every single lunch. You know, why not have something slightly more tailored to a remote workforce that wants to spend six or seven pounds on a, on a meal. Um, so there's, it's, they're definitely starting to think, um, think more about how they can accommodate that type of workforce. And it's something that actually, you know, we work did tremendously well. Um, they took corporate office buildings, made them look cool gave out free beer and Prosecco and essentially just copied exactly what a hotel lobby looks like, but they were charging five, 600 pounds a month for it. Um, so there's definitely, it was evident that they were valuing their space, their sort of communal spaces more than a hotel was valuing their space. Whereas hotels are just thinking about how many keys they can sell. They're now starting to think about, right, we've got this lobby. What can we do with it? Can we have, you know, if you look at the standard, for example, in King's Cross, they've got a they've got a recording studio, they've got a podcast recording studio, they've got you know a space where you can co-work. It's it's all about diversifying your revenue through use of space. Yeah, if I could just tag on to that, I think that the hotels needed need to move that way anyway because a lot of the spaces and the way they've been designing when they design it around um, you know just room count. Um, it's left them sort of a in a financially unfeasible position and that's being highlighted now more than than ever so um you know to to go back to what hotel hotels used to actually be really community oriented they you know they were never at one point they weren't so that um you know all these international travelers came in and then they they went to see the city and then they slept and then they all went back to wherever that was never the original intention or model of a hotel. A hotel used to be a very community oriented place in which you'd have somebody who, you know, you'd have a chair named after him because he literally had his coffee there every single morning at nine o'clock in the morning. And so um, I think that the hotel industry is needing to move that direction anyway. Um, and it's been really highlighted now. So designers are starting to, to catch on to that and, um, and more and more design is going that direction. Mm -hmm. We've got a question in the chat already, which I will which I'll address now because it's uh, it's a topic that was uh, on our list anyway. Um, uh, it says uh, it's from Le Comte McShane, which is a splendid name. Uh, it's okay to be able to work remotely thanks to internet connections, but what about the human connections? Workplace is a place of socialization and network. Um, there's been several articles in in the press recently about people bemoaning the fact that they really miss the office. Um, not just the fact that you can go out and have a drink with your colleagues afterwards, but um, all, all kinds of other reasons. So it's how you learn from other people. It's how, it's how friendships form. Uh, it's, it enables teamwork and so on. So what are we missing by not being in the office? What, what, what do you think of the, 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 um, the kind of psychological benefits to, to actually working in an office? Um, 
Charlie, do you want to kick off with that one? Sure. Um, so, yeah, I, for me, I think the human interaction is, is vital. And I think that's what everyone's missing. I think, um, to Shelley's point, this idea about members clubs and, you know, reinventing, I think everything should be now, now, ugh, now about destinations and getting more than just one thing at one place. Um, but I think it's the small things. It's, you know, being able to ask questions to someone that you maybe couldn't ask over Zoom or over Slack. Um, it's a mental health thing. It's having a physical break from, from your home life. Um, there's a big, you know, there's two big campaigns at the moment. One is obviously about domestic violence and, and, and work being an escape for some people. And the other one is about, you know, everyone's home is not equal, whereas the office was a, you know, equal footing, if you like. So whether it's access technology, I mean, not everyone has um a spare bedroom or, or a work desk or whatever else or has you know five six people in the house so i think there's a lot that we're missing from from going into the office and i hope that as you say it will be more of a blended return with kind of three days in two days out because i think you know i think flexible working is the future but i think and maybe this would be the resurgence of co-working is that and this whole hub and spoke concept that you know, you'll go somewhere to get your Wi-Fi and your office fixed, but not necessarily into central London. Mm -hmm. And Tom, how, how would you summarise the, the benefits of, of being in an office environment? Um, <laughs> well, we, we work completely remotely. We always have done. Obviously, we work from all of our different venues, so we haven't been in, in an office for a while. I don't know if anyone saw the Dettol ad that went out on the, on the tubes recently where it was basically listed all the things that they thought that everyone missed about the office but actually it's sort of the tone of it was completely misinterpreted and everyone thought it, it was read as if it was all the, the things that actually people hated and it was all about you know bosses jokes and, and it was a bit of a bit of a flop whether it was intentional or not i'm not i'm not sure um yeah i think i think there's there's, a, there's this real point around mental health um you know when we set up um, and goes we were predominantly working with freelancers and isolation is a huge problem within the freelance community and that's why we were trying to get people out of their own homes and into some of our venues so that they can sit and work together we built into the app that you can actually see who else is working in the space with you fill out a sort of member profile you can go and connect with them on a physical level so it's sort of like the icebreaker and i think that's you know the human interaction is is the most important thing, you know, like going for drinks after work, um, you know, being able to bounce ideas off each other, which you just can't do on a Zoom call, on a, on a Zoom meeting, obviously we're using it now, but you can't have those sort of side conversations that you have in a meeting and, and that you actually learn so much from being able to see how someone conducts themselves in a meeting as well as is key to be able to learn from, you know, people higher up the food chain, your managers, whoever they are. Um, so yeah, for me, I think it's it's just around human human connection and getting out of your own space is really important. Not staring at the same four walls every every single day. Um, you know, you have, you have to have those kind of um, those inputs into your life that kind of make a difference. And the office space or wherever you choose to work is um, is vital in that. I think in your kind of personal development. Charlie raises a good point that not all home offices are created equal. Um, my own office is also a spare bedroom and a storage place for random stuff that doesn't seem to fit anywhere else. And I don't suppose I'm alone in that. So what are some of the best practices we can use for our working environments at home? How, how can we make them um, more efficient, more pleasant to work in and um, you know, help us be, be more be more creative you know enhance our output um Shelley do you want to address that from from the design side first yeah sure uh, well first of all I think the most important thing is wherever you set up um to make sure your setup is ergonomic because um <clears throat> you know unlike an office space where you have professionals and that are devoted to that <clears throat> and someone typically comes in and sets it up for you so that it is and you know all your chairs might come from Herman Miller and they're made to be ergonomic chairs all of a sudden you find yourself um, you know crowded in your in a little corner somewhere um, I think that devoting some time to 
you know, analyzing the height of your screens, the height of your desk, the comfort of your chair, to making sure that all of that is set up so that it doesn't physically disable you is, is really, really key um, because you do still spend a lot of time at your desk. Um, and then regards to, you know, size of homes and how to do that, there's a lot of clever ways if you have a tiny space there's a lot of clever ways to um, easily, easily put a desk in into that space um, just by using vertical storage and you know having horizontal desking off of it um, but I think the issue that everyone will struggle with is when there's multiple people in the home how, how do you deal with that because privacy um, Privacy can be really challenging, and particularly if you're on Zoom calls every single day. Um, and that there's no solution. I don't think there's any solution to that other than having separate spaces for the various people in the home and having, you know, garden space, I think is great as well, if it's possible. Um, Tom, have you got any good tips for us to improve our home office environment? Get out of your home. <laughs> I think it's, um... <laughs> I think it's, it's about that divide, isn't it? Dividing your, your work and your life and, and getting the right balance there. And I think, um, obviously, you know, Shelley talking about the ergonomics of your home is, is very important. And, you know, that getting bad backs from sitting on a, on a bad chair is obviously going to, you know, affect your mental health and the way you concentrate and the way you work as well. So, yeah, I think it's if you can, it's just it's finding the right space within your home to set up properly and spending a bit of bit of time and a, and a small amount of money, you know, doesn't doesn't hurt and it goes a long way actually. And obviously, it was difficult to tell how long this is going to go on for at the beginning, um, but there's some really cool companies out there that are kind of finding solutions for you know desks out of recycled cardboard or, or whatever it is. You know, there's there's options out there. Um, it's just about spending a bit of time and maybe a small amount of cash to do it. Mm -hmm. The wellness trend, which has been um, focused on a lot in hospitality in recent years, is obviously now starting to be introduced to, to office design and office operations. Um, one of the bullet points I showed earlier was talking about biophilic design and having plants and, and, and that kind of stuff. So, um, Charlie, what, what elements do you bring into your premises that would come under the wellness bracket what what can you do to help people mentally even if it's very you know very subliminal things just colors plants that kind of thing what what, what sort of stuff are the quick fixes to create um, you know a good environment for people to work in basically well i think the big thing at the moment is ventilation so um, you know, having good ventilation and obviously space. I think plants have always been, you know, something that's great in the workplace. I think it's not just about the space, I think it's about the community. And this also goes back to the, the previous conversation about working from home. I think, you know, having a routine and, and being mindful and, and, you know, whether it's meditation or going for a walk or, you know, getting dressed. <laughs> like going to sit. Sure in your pajamas all day and I think it's been particularly tough people on furlough um but I think you know you know at, at Cookies Nest we've always tried to um have wellness at the forefront but from a, an event perspective so uh, we do a lot about you know um postnatal depression and and parenting and the anxieties of being a working mom and stuff like that so and we've just you know kicked kick some of that off again and, and did, 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 a, did a lot of it online during lockdown um so i think it's it's more about the individuals and, and keeping them motivated um and you know providing access to wellness content rather than just putting plants in the space mm -hmm. obviously over lockdown a, a lot of people have been trying to work from home while having to home school as well which obviously is a um a particular set of challenges and i think a lot of people have found that very difficult do you do you see that as an opportunity to help grow your model so it, it's a you know you can still be around your kids you can still be in the same building but you, you you're left free to focus on what you need to do and have professionals look after the children mm. so i 
think there is a, a, a big shift at the moment. So ed tech has, has, has rocketed. I think the UK ed tech markets like 3.5 billion um, will be worth that by next year. And there's been a kind of 100% increase in investment into the sector. So being able to, you know, do teaching at, at home um, has that kind of revolution's already started. I read a, a terribly depressing article in The Independent yesterday, which says that um, two out of five parents or carers um, are, are at risk of redundancy come the end of furlough. And, you know, I think that's really going to hit the childcare sector, which already um, is struggling after having, you know, as we all have, you know, months of, of zero revenue and sadly very little funding. So I think we're going to lose a lot of, you know, nursery spaces in central London, um, which is going to put a massive upward um, pressure on, on demand and supply. So, yeah, I think there will be a move to, towards more kind of, um, yeah, teaching from home, kind of setting up people camping together with friends in the area and kind of getting a tutor and, and doing it more themselves. I think the other big opportunity that I see for us is actually putting nurseries into the big offices. So, you know, Deloitte's office or whoever, I think as they look to reconfigure their workspace and maybe have a more flexible um, work schedule for their employees that there's potentially surplus office space and perhaps companies will finally start subsidizing childcare for their employees and support their you know parent workforce. Great thanks Johnny. So Tom your your premises at the moment are all in hospitality venues. Um, as we alluded to earlier we're likely to see um, excess office inventory being repurposed for other uses in future. Would you guys be interested in taking some of that and converting it from a traditional office into something that suits the model you do or, or is hospitality the, 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 the way forward for you guys still? Um, I mean our, our model is obviously it's very light. Um, we, we work with hospitality venues so it's for us it's never really been about the office it's about footfall in in venues and and driving footfall and meeting room bookings uh back to the high street rather than kind of stonewalling within an in an office environment so i mean it'd be, it'd be interesting to see what happens with all these empty buildings and obviously they're gonna have to think about how they diversify their own space now um but yeah I, i'm not sure it's not it's not on the on the radar for us at the moment just because it doesn't really fit into the into the model per se um but obviously you know we're, we're a startup so we would be we'd be looking at looking at everything if it if it kind of comes uh comes to us in the right way but for us it's always been about you know helping out the venues as much as possible um and repurposing space that already exists rather than setting up new space because there's so much there is so much space around us that isn't being used um so th there's really no need for any more co-working offices as a sort of proper space there's, <clears throat> there's actually a question for you tom in the chat which follows on nicely from that it says do you see co-working or remote working spaces outside of the major cities uh, particularly out of london as growth areas perhaps the growth of commuter towns as sub office hubs yeah um literally been on um this week uh to the team about getting more uh venues in commuter towns we've uh, kind of identified the areas that we want to tackle um before lockdown it was all about central london because everyone's still commuting into into town but actually um the trend that we're seeing now is that people well people aren't commuting into into central london anymore they don't need the office space they're actually scaling back you know, all their, their offices or their companies aren't allowing them to come back, but they're saying that they don't have to. So people are looking to break out of their own homes, but into space that's near them. Um, you know, there's thousands of people that commute into central London every single day. And all those people are looking for, looking for space now. So we've been, we've had several inquiries from, um, from corporates that are looking to provide flexible space to their workforce. Um, and they're looking for space in the sort of the, the rural rural areas and the, the, the kind of the commuter towns of Greater London. Um, so yeah, one hundred percent. It's it was we've had several meetings about it this week. 
Excellent. Okay. Uh, and Charlie, how about you? Would you open a cuckoo's nest in Guildford or Colchester or somewhere? Or are you very much a, a London model at the moment? No, absolutely. I'm looking at, at two sites currently, which are kind of periphery London, just outside the M25. Um, because, you know, I think that central London sadly is gone for the foreseeable. And I think that, as you mentioned, I think, Tom, about this 30 days to change a habit, I think habits are truly changed now, our work habits. Um, so, yeah, definitely looking outside of London now. Mm -hmm. um, Tom, does that mean you're seeing the types of um, hospitality properties you're, you're looking at? I mean, for example, could we see Anco in a, in a country house hotel and, uh, you know, different, different styles of venues? Is that, are these kind of hospitality operators open to having non-residents come in and work there? Yeah. Um, I mean, I had, I mean, Richmond's not probably a great example, but I just had a good meeting in, in Richmond with exactly that, you know, nice, nice big hotel there that have, they've got 14 or 15 meeting rooms. Um, they've got empty lobby space and they, they want footfall. Um, and it's nice to see that that type of venue is thinking about how they're, you know, generating revenue in the, in the future as well. So it kind of, the, the model sort of applies anywhere and everywhere, as long as it works with the venues, it's, uh, and they're happy to, to run it. It's one of those things that can literally work in, in any space. Um, and the, and the beauty of it, having such a diverse, uh, set of venues is that for a member, you get to kind of choose your own office, you choose your own environment. You know, it's not that you're, you're not having to go and you're not forced to go and work from a specific aesthetic of office space that your company decides to join. It's, it's depending on what type of day it is, what, you know, where it is in London, you know, what, what music's playing, all that kind of stuff plays into how well your working day goes. So it's all about that kind of flexibility of choice. And if you want to work from a country house hotel, then, and, and that's the way you like to work, then, you know, we, we definitely accommodate that as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, we've had an extremely topical call about design here from Deborah Udolf. Uh, she asks, will the design of workspaces be different to take it, take account of the need for Zoom and team calls and the need to hear and talk quite loudly? Is it, um, Shelley, do you want to start with that one? Is, is, are we going to be on Zoom calls, uh, you know, e even in, in co-working spaces when we're all getting back together again? Yeah, probably. I mean, I could. I mean, I can see it. If you've got a big global company and you don't want, you know, and all your workers are not coming into the office anymore, uh, you know, I could certainly see that you may have a group of five who live out in Greenwich and another group of five who live in another area, another group of five who live here, all getting together in smaller groups so they can still interact face to face, but you still might need to have a larger Zoom call to to capture everyone. So absolutely, I think that, that, that I think that these webinar calls are here to stay and um, and when designing office space or designing what I call the social hub space in a hotel, um, the balance of having private, private areas and public areas is extremely important. You need both. Um, you need both in order to work effectively. You're going to need some pretty good soundproofing and uh, you're going to need soundproofing areas, exactly yeah yeah because you don't want to be handing out noise cancelling headphones at the door do you no absolutely not actually one of my colleagues her um told me this week that her husband is going back into the office from this week and where he works they're doing a week on and a week off um but they have to go in the office they have to wear masks and they spend most of their time on Zoom calls to their colleagues who are still at home. <laughs> Which, yeah, uh, why bother, right? Yeah. Seems a slightly Kafkaesque way of doing things at the moment. Yeah, I imagine that's going to be a problem for a lot of people as they go back. Yeah, yeah. Well, let, let's try and take a, um, a medium to long term look um, at how we think people will be working. Obviously, we, we, I think we're all in agreement that for the short term it's going to be very much a blend uh, of working from home and, and, and in, a, in an office environment um where do we think we're going to be in two years time and, and five years time and, and how do you think that balance is going to change 
Um, Charlie, do you want to start with that one? I'll pass it to Tom to start with that one. <laughs> yeah, happy to. Um, so I, we've, we've obviously seen this for the, I mean, remote work's not a new thing. It's been going on for, for decades. Um, so I think what's happened is it's just, it's, it's all just catapulted forward 10 years anyway in the last kind of six or so months or however long it's been now. And I, I don't see that changing. I think, um, as we've said, it's not one or the other. It's not going to be working from home or working from an office. It's going to be this, this balance of being able to work from where you choose to work from. And whether that's in a coffee shop, whether it's in a third space, or whether it's in the office or at home, it's kind of up to you. And, and what's been so nice about this is that you have the, the employee has that choice now and they have this sort of slight power shift um, has happened. So, um, you know, there's several reports going around, there's several surveys where CEOs, CFOs, CROs have been interviewed and, and, and the majority of them are planning for some kind of remote work strategy to be put in place or if, if, if not already in place. So it's just becoming, it's, it's mainstream now, it's become the, the, the new normal as everyone keeps saying. So I don't see that, that changing. I think it's going to get um, more and more prevalent as we go on. There will always be an office space of some sort. People will always need a hub or, you know, a small place where maybe the senior management team can come and meet on a, on a weekly basis, whatever it is, but there's the, the hub and spoke model that everyone's talking about is just, it's just the way forward. And it makes sense for companies, you know, especially startups that are setting up and not having to spend millions of pounds a year on office spaces, you know, that it's, I don't see any kind of, you know, negative um, aspect of people working remotely from, um, from your bottom line all the way through to the mental health of your employees. It just, it just makes sense. Um, and it has taken the global pandemic for us to realize that and for us to actually do it. But there's, you know, that there's, it's just the way it's going to be. And do you think that blue chip companies in industries that have traditionally all been centered in one area, I'm thinking mainly about the city. So all these financial institutions all crammed into one place. Can you really see those guys sort of devolving where people work to a hub and spoke concept and having small offices across the country? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, if you think about it, it actually massively opens up your, the, the talent pool. If, you, if you're able to have, you know, different areas of, of, of the country uh, where you have, you know, small uh, or headquarters in London or whatever, wherever it is, and then small offices dotted around, you can start to attract, you know, serious talent from elsewhere other than just London or forcing people to move into London or into London or whatever. Yeah. Um, it's, it's happening, you know, there's, there's all the companies already doing it and, and you know the financial institutions are probably going to take a little bit longer to because you know they like being in an office together and, and making deals and whatever it is but it's i think they'll be left behind if they carry on the way they are and i think if i could add on to that i think traditionally you know the global nomads have always been sort of marketed and understood as a generation x um or sorry as a millennium um era um, anomaly um, and primarily being used by younger people and by tech companies but I think you know to your question earlier about how we are two years and five years I think right now we are in a growing pain period and people are trying to understand how this works and how it can work and what the potential is and the possibilities are and I think we will get out of that and as people sit in that period and go through that period one of the things that I think will everybody will realize just from a human Point of view is that it offers you the ability to be able to um, expand your what would what would before have been thought of as leisure time so you know if you think about holidays for example we have a very limited amount of time to spend on our holidays and a lot of people might have somebody who lives in New Zealand say their parents live in New Zealand and their in-laws live in the US for example and they have to choose which which family they might see that year because they're so limited by that having to be in the office. And what this working allows for people to do is to truly just pick up and go and live in another country and, you know, maybe spend time with your aging parents for 
three months and be able to still carry on working. We have somebody right now, one of our designers, she actually got stranded in Barcelona during the pandemic and has decided to stay there. And she's just carrying on working as normal. So I think that what what's going to happen is even the more conservative sort of blue chip companies who haven't really tagged on to this yet, their employees are going to see the benefits of that um, as we work through these growing pains. And I think their employees will demand that it happen from them because there's so much positivity to it. We, you know, there is the social aspect that has to still be maintained. But when you look at the, the ability to pick up and move around, there's that it's so positive for people. From my perspective, I'm slightly um, feeling myself in disagreement with you both. I think the whole nomad digital remote work thing was already happening. And as you say, Tom, you know, freelancers self-employed, they can do that. And it's almost part of the thing, right? Working from home and, and not doing the nine to five. I think the majority of people work in big companies, though. And I think even though this has been a shift change and a catalyst, it's going to take a long time. I don't think in two years we're going to have everyone with these hub and spokes. Um, and there's obviously several industries which can't work. Right? So construction, as an example, you know, they're on site. Um, and I think it's very difficult for big corporates to have a policy like this, which doesn't fit all types of employees. Um, and, and back to the point about, you know, not all homes are equal. I, I'm not entirely sure this is going to change. I think that, you know, the example of 9-11 and everyone saying they'd never get on a plane again and, and, and the kind of flash in a pan mentality of people forgetting stuff could be the way it goes and that everyone's more on pause right now. No one knows what to do, what policies to put in place um, and is exploring options, but ne definitely don't think anyone's got a game plan to move out of central London. And then what does that mean for central London? And, and it's a global top 10 city and, you know, our economy as a whole. So uh, <laughs> I guess I, I, I think it's, there's no clean answer on where we're going to be in two years. Sorry, George. <laughs> or even two weeks, let's face it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, what I do know is we've only got two minutes left on the session and there are a couple of uh, questions in there that unfortunately we're not going to get around to, but, uh, if you'd like to ask these guys more questions, um, you can do via the uh, LinkedIn um, addresses that were in the chat earlier. Um, I'm just gonna run through a few slides before I thank our panelists for a, a great discussion. Uh, next week's session is about branded residences and mixed use developments. Um, we've got a great uh, panel there. As you can see, the session is sponsored by Comscope uh, and that is next Wednesday at 2 p.m. so I look forward to see uh, plenty of you there. We've also launched a couple of other webinar series um, that are devoted streams for two of our B2B websites. Uh, so Paul from Short Term Rentals has got uh, the Rockstars series which is quite a nice play on our logo there where he's uh, talking to uh, leading players in that space uh, and Eloise from Boutique Hotel News has got the Trailblazer series and you can see uh, a list of dates for both those webinar series there. Uh, as I said, this webinar is one of a series, it's a precursor to the Urban Living Festival, which is taking place in November. Uh, we've got a fantastic cast of sponsors and speakers and exhibitors, a few of whom will be flushing before your eyes now. Yeah, here we go. Uh, if you'd like to get involved, please do contact my colleague Katie, uh, whose details I believe are in the chat now. Yes, they are, and as is the uh, registration for the session. Uh, the next three webinars in this Urban Living series are here. So Branded Residences, um, Meet the Money, and New Real Estate Models. So I'd just like to say thanks very much to Tom, to Shelley and to Charlie for their time and their input. I think it's been a great session. Uh, thank you to you all for joining the call. I uh, hope to see lots of you on next week's session. Uh, goodbye for now. Thanks very much. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Bye. Bye.